Okay, we are live. So, welcome to the second month of Liberalist Book Club. Um, this month's book is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Um, yeah, let's just jump right into the questions. I have Blake and Cody with me. Um, so my first question is just, how did you like it overall? How was the reading experience and was it difficult for you to get into? Cody, you want to go first? Well, uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, so I, I enjoyed the book, uh, though it was kind of hard to get into the mindset of like a per I was trying to imagine myself kind of in their positions and it was hard with just kind of how their worldview it was hard to do that at first and even even to like the middle of the book it and i really didn't start enjoying the book more until i met the you know the character of john yeah for sure i had the same thing he's obviously the the most relatable that actually comes into a, a later question about relatable and I actually found Bernard for me a little bit more relatable and Hemholtz as well. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But for me, um, I, I did enjoy the book. Uh, I have to admit, I did actually read it originally about 25 years ago. Um, and uh, I got a lot more out of it this time around. Um, I found it very interesting to read because I grew up reading a lot of Isaac Asimov, particularly his Foundation series, which was started at in the... 40s, late 30s, 1940s. So it's, yeah. a sim it's a similar era. So there's a very similar writing style uh, and a similar way of structuring the stories to uh, between Brave New World and the Foundation series. So uh, I, it was kind of like slipping into uh, world slippers, you know, getting comfortable with an old um, writing style that I was familiar with. Yeah. I've actually read the first book in the Foundation series. It was chosen. I did like a uh, teen book club when I was a teenager and that was one of the books that one of the guys in the group chose I barely remember it but I remember it, it being kind of a a stretch to get into but I think I enjoyed it but I, I definitely see what you mean with the similarities yeah the uh, the first foundation book's a little bit unusual because uh, it was originally written as a, as a serial so it was published in uh, in bits and pieces in Pulp Fiction uh, but as later books were published, were written and published as, as whole uh, novels. But uh, we're talking about Brave New World, not Foundation. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, the gist is basically it's a very similar writing style, uh, similar way of structuring stories, uh, even to the same, uh, I, I think the word is trope or same style where it's mm. kind of like a murder mystery. You, you're not quite sure what's going on. You're exploring the world. And then at the end, there's this big exposition by usually somebody that's in charge of things and they kind of they just right. explain everything and uh that happens in the foundation series and uh it's also it also happens in 1984 which is not unsurprising true yeah i i really liked it i i'm used to reading classics and older books so it wasn't so much that it was hard for me to read an older kind of more antiquated style but I found the beginning very choppy. Like, it's supposed to be that way. But I kind of struggled in the first kind of quarter when it's mostly just a tour of the, the, um, the center where the, you know, where the people are grown in the tubes. That, that was a little bit hard for me to get into because it's a very technical, dry look at how they, how, how they start life in this world. But, uh, once, once it kind of got past that, it was easier for me to read. Yeah, especially that, that one part of one chapter where they're al it, he's alternating uh, between, th I think it's three different viewpoints. Yeah, and oh my God. Quotes, and it's not giving him any indication of who's speaking. You have to figure it out. I actually had to go back and read that a second time just to make sure I understood who was saying what. Yeah, yeah for that, sure. That, um, that that part was probably, I agree, that part was the hardest to understand, but I really liked that uh, the first three, four chapters where we're just kind of giving you a, a, a sense of how, like, how controlled and how, uh, uh, 
uh, I guess, yeah, just how controlled the, the, this whole this whole system was from beginning to end. Yeah, it was a really good look at just how, yeah, how tightly controlled it is, how they are so, like, we talk about invasive government and stuff when we're just talking about taxes, but they literally control you from the moment of, like, conception. It's it's so nuts. So it's a really good introduction to that, but it's quite dry to literally read a tour of like a factory. <laughs> but yeah, I love the part where it's like snapping back and forth, like between each sentence between the three different viewpoints. That was actually really like I could picture it so well. It was almost it was almost like cinematic, like quick edits. Yeah, it's it's interesting you said it that way because that style is actually much more modern, more, it's something we're familiar with from, in films, when people mm -hmm. do that in films. And it, I, I have to imagine that back when he wrote the book, that was probably a very new way of doing things. It was not serial, it was not in order, and it yeah. was pro probably very unusual for the time. Yeah, for sure. And I think didn't I think Huxley did write screenplays too a bit later when he moved to America, so it kind of seemed like he his writing was made for that medium. Yeah, I think I read that as well. I also remember correctly he had a hard time actually getting them purchased by studios. Yeah, and there was one really famous movie that I read that he wrote a script for, but they turned it down, and it was like a really famous movie. I wish I could remember what it was now, and I don't have my copy of the book on me, but it was like a really, really famous movie, and I was like, oh my god. It was like, oh, I can't remember what it was. Something really famous threw me off. But, uh, so as it, as the book progressed, do you guys agree that it got, like, much more immediate once we were kind of focused in on, like, Bernard and John? Yes, absolutely. Once it became, uh, <laughs> specific about their experiences and what they were going through and what they were trying to do. Uh, it was much more engaging. Uh, but I suppose in the time he kind of had to set up the, the background, set up the environment and uh, yeah. using the old style, you don't kind of let it unravel as you see or read what's going on. You just kind of lay it all, lay it all out, out at, at front, at the front. Yeah. It's almost like building a, it was like he was building the architecture of the world, almost like how we, like you set on you set up a play, and you have to build the sets first. That's what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think that it's it's almost more of a political vision than a novel. So the setup was super important to the overall point. Well, yeah, and uh, um, one of the uh, one of the things I read uh, just about uh, some of the some of the contemporary um, uh, reviews, I guess, of, of the time, was that a lot of people didn't like the book because it, it was obvious that he was more concerned about the world and the politics of it, and less so with the characters. Right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. So my second question is, how do you think the world state compares to our world? Do you think Huxley's vision of the future is accurate? I'll uh, start with this one, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so uh, um, I don't think it compares to our current world very well at all. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it does still put forward a very good message, I guess you could say, or moral of the story about what not to do. Um, there's things didn't go, obviously didn't quite go as as he thought. Um, and there's a lot of uh, if you actually this will come up later. If you if you read his uh, the revisited essay as well as some mm -hmm. of uh, the stuff he wrote later, uh, you can kind of tell that he's he, he realizes things that weren't going quite as expected. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. So the uh, so the, the the world state he's he's envisioned is uh, it's not like today. Uh, it's not like the near future. 
uh, but it is a it's a course that we don't want to pursue. Uh, it's interesting the ties into the globalism. He did have basically a one world state, um, which yeah. uh, a lot of people envision. Um, and uh, there's definitely a very heavy collectivist sentiment in there. Uh, the world state that he envisioned was entirely collectivist. Um, so that's something we're dealing with right now as well. Um, the One of the interesting things that I found about what he was writing in terms of the, the way people were conditioned, the way people were uh, genetically manipulated as, and as well as socially, um, uh, socially engineered, I guess you could say, uh, it was very brilliant for the time, but with the science that we know now, we know that what he was saying in the book wouldn't work. Uh, the idea of uh, sleep learning in order to precondition someone to fit into society, um, we know that we know that can't work. Not not just the sleep learning, but the fact that uh, human beings do have uh, built-in modules for cognition that uh, would get in the way of that. Um, but having said that, he could have just you could just tweak a few things in the science of the book to say, to, to make it work, uh, to say, uh, oh, we manipulated the genetics of the brain in order for this to work. Um, of course, at that point, you have to wonder whether people would still be human after that. But uh, I'm not sure yeah, yeah. if, I'm not sure if what I'm saying is actually making sense here. I'm just kind of. Uh, no, yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, that's my answer to that question. Okay. Um, unless you want to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's definitely the advent of technology affects the accuracy of his vision. Like there's stuff that he could never have foreseen that have probably permanently altered the likelihood of his vision coming to fruition. But uh, I think there's a lot of parallels that are kind of cropping up more now and they're very extremist and fringe and i don't think they're going to take over the world but the idea of everybody belongs to everybody else like you see that in the riley dennis's of the world and the people who talk about you know not being attracted to trans people as being transphobic and just a, a slight intrusion on people's personal choices and, and personal preferences. So that I think is a slight reflection in the world, but I, I it's super fringe and I don't think it's gonna take over, but the Brave New World definitely shows what can happen if it did, and it's horrible. <laughs> yes, um, so do I, do I think that, you know, or how do I think it compares to our world? I definitely would agree that we don't live in a world where this is the thing, but I, I definitely, if I had to compare it to say, I mean, to a later question kind of, if I had to compare it to kind of the vision in 1984, I would have to say that this would be lot, uh, more likely, I guess. Really? Um, Interesting. Uh, just because it's, um, it's a setup where everyone, and you can dispute whether or not this is possible, but it's a setup where everyone or almost everyone is happy with how things are going. It's not like they're being, they're not being held down after they've gone through all those things. It, they hmm. they want it to continue this way. And that's kind of slow creep of, uh, of just um, uh, basically making people happy and, and doing that, doing that kind of thing, you know, you know, pleasure and all that stuff. Um, that I feel is a lot more insidious than like a totalitarian, fo like forcefully taking over or something. Um, yeah, for sure. I didn't even think about that, but yeah, they do have, they have such a negative idea of negative feelings. Like they view it as like unseemly to be unhappy or upset by something. And so as a result, they're super weak. And there's a later question about Soma here, but that kind of ties into it. So I, I, I do see some of that in the world for sure. Um, and like there's uh, there's a recent news story that just happened in Canada. I think it was in Toronto where there's an air show. And uh, there's a certain group that was lobbying for the air show to be canceled because planes flying overhead 
would like trigger PTSD in Syrian oh. refugees. Oh. Oh, <laughs> like pla if if planes flying overhead sends you into a PTSD meltdown, I don't know. I you have big well, problems. I, to be fair, it depends on the, their individual experiences. If there's someone like if you if you were to talk about like if you were to talk someone who lived through World War II London, I think I could understand that. And so if they're in a situation, oh, yeah. I'd have to see it on an individual to individual basis. But I doubt sure. that. I, but I doubt that ninety nine percent of them are actually of that case. Or I, it probably even less than that. But you know, I doubt that exactly. Any yeah. significant amount is is any significant amount of them is uh, uh, actually falls under that category. And, and even the ones that do is probably such a small minority that maybe they could. I don't know. They could probably do something to keep them from hearing it or something. I don't know. But, yeah, and uh, the, the for the people that actually truly are experiencing PTSD because of it, then they need actual professional help. Yes, uh, exactly. They need treatment for the PTSD, um, and it's not appropriate to expect all of society to cater to the to their needs. It's the the expectation is that they take care of themselves and and try to yeah. to deal with the issue and overcome it. Yeah, an extreme avoidance of things that are difficult and hard for you and that affect you is th the solution to those things is not to hide away from the world and change the world so that it, you don't get hurt. The solution is to make yourself stronger. So mm -hmm. if we get a if we have a, a societal tendency to change the world instead of strengthening individuals, I think that is totally what happened in Brave New World. Uh, well, but I mean, humans have throughout history changed their world to make it easier for them. I mean, that's how we survived. Uh, for sure, so, yeah. So there has there has to be some sort of balance there, and mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm not I'm nowhere near knowledgeable enough to know where that balance is. If I'd probably defer to like Jordan Peterson or something to to to, to talk about where that balance is. Yeah, for um, sure. Or someone like him at least. Yeah, uh, like how like antidepressant drugs are good for the people that they work on, and it's something that a lot of us will have to try and experiment with, and it helps a lot of people, but everybody taking mass quantities of drugs when they feel slightly sad is not the answer. Right, yes, this is definitely... But uh, but you, you, but you can kind of see this kind of creep in that direction, I think. And that, that's why, that's to what I said earlier, is the reason I think this is more likely than than a lot of, like, you know, totalitarian dystopian societies. Mm -hmm. um, and to the, I think there was the, do I think his vision of the future is accurate? I don't know. I wouldn't say his vision of, his vision of the future, even going forward from now, is necessarily accurate. Um, I'm more, I, I was thinking about, is, for this question, I was thinking, framing it more, is it possible? Because, you know, like right, the whole, yeah. uh, the whole idea of um, blank slate after birth is definitely not, I mean, it's been disproven over and over again. But, uh, yeah. But then, then it comes in. I think. Uh, 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 are we are we okay to use our names? I mean, I know my name's on there, but I just don't know if I should just. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Blake. Yeah. Okay. So Blake said that. Uh, um, uh, that you know, with messing with the genetics in the in the brain and stuff, you you might actually be able to do this. And I, and I was just thinking, like, if you if you started at, at a cell and mess with the genetics, then you might be able to make the argument that. That whatever you're creating is a blank slate, at least within the boundaries of what life is. And so yeah. I see that I definitely see it as a as a um, something that something that potentially could happen given the, the technology. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's interesting that their their uh, kind of substitute for sexual reproduction comes from this like weird revulsion towards like motherhood and procreation mm -hmm. which which comes from their disdain for you know personal preferences and exclusion you know the the relationship between mother and child is like the ultimate exclusive emotional experience so they they tried to they they tore that right down and then they changed it so that we're creating babies in tubes and well and it's, i'm sure the 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 process the bodily process of like birth and all that is also uh something that would that they would find re repulsive on top yeah. of that yeah so it's interesting that it comes from like all like this whole world kind of came out of the desire to make people feel included by like demolishing the most exclusive of relationships 
it's really creepy when you trace it back to that. I, uh, I think it actually goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, it was it was explained. The goal, the entire goal of society was to re to reach stability. Stability was the right. highest goal, mm -hmm. and they viewed negative emotion as uh, antithetical to stability. And there's a good argument for that. You know, if everything yeah. is safe and sound, and then something horrible happens, well, now you're unstable. Uh, so the argument for abolishing not abolishing, but avoiding negative experiences at all costs was in the goal of seeking stability. Mm -hmm. And having personal relationships with other people is a very high risk factor for having negative experiences. So of course you yes. just get rid of that as well. You just have um, fun and games, bread and circuses. There's no emotional connections at all. Uh, and yeah. that was all to serve the purpose of having a stable society. Yeah, so creepy. Cause it goes so, oh, it's cause it's so, it's so the opposite of what we have. And like, you can think of our world as being, you know, we're so technical, technologically advanced compared to theirs. And like some of the tech talked about in the book is funny cause it's so silly and old fashioned. But when you look at our culture, we're so much more primitive in a way. And that's kind of like represented by the, the uh the reservation like that's our society that we have now do we just have the tech that makes us you know like more advanced than the world state so it, it's such a weird it's such a weird like way that we have it now compared to what's in the book yeah. i'd like to uh bring up another parallel that i that i was just thinking of um mm. so they have the stable society and everybody's genetically engineered and uh, societally conditioned to fit in. Um, however, there's a few anomalies. There's, there's people that fail. There's people that uh, don't fit in. They, they start to feel individual uh, thoughts and feelings. They want to do something different. And um, this society has uh, worked out how to deal with that. It's kind of like an acceptable loss. They take these people and stick them on an island, um, which actually, as the world controller says, that's actually probably a good thing for those people because they get to be with people that are like them. Uh, yeah. But there's a very there's a very clear connection between that and the Matrix, the movie series. Right. Uh, so even even to the point where um, uh, there's the scene in the first one where uh, Agent Smith is like, uh, you know, the first Matrix was perfect. It was a paradise, and uh, it was a disaster. People kept waking up uh and that's kind of the same thing right where they recognize that there's so they filled another matrix where everything was good for most people uh but then the people that woke up they created a system to get them out and isolate them and mm -hmm. there's a system for handling that and who knows maybe maybe you know writing the matrix they kind of ripped off a little bit of this or is this, it's not exactly a, a unique a unique story but yeah it's, probably there's definitely a parallel between the two I need to rewatch The Matrix. I I've seen it in ages. I actually haven't seen the whole thing. I'm I'm pretty culturally illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being really good, but it warrants a rewatch. I, I've probably seen it 20, 30 times at least. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so my next question is who do you think is the protagonist and which character do you think is most sympathetic? Um, if I had to pick a protagonist in sort of the uh, uh, way, I guess I, I would say traditional sense, and maybe I'm not well versed in what the traditional sense is, but well, the way I would view it um, would be would be John, because he he is like uh, to kind of connect it to the second part of the question. He is the one we most we most connect with, the person that we you know we're, we're rooting for to some to some extent. Yeah, I think that there were two. I think that the roughly the first half of the book as Bernard Marx mm -hmm. uh, with the supporting character of Helmut Swanson. Um, and then it transitions. It transitions to John, John Savage, uh, where Marx is the insider that is feeling out of place, that is uh, trying to get away with being different and struggling with that. Uh, and then it slowly, he goes and meets 
John Savage and brings him back. And then it, over that, it slowly transitions um, to the outsider who is coming into this world and experiencing it uh, from a different perspective. And then the rest of the book is pretty much about John, where with Bernard Marx being a secondary character uh, and how his craven attitude and his uh, moral, uh, his, <laughs> his lack of moral fortitude uh, causes some problems. Um, but so I, I don't think there was one. I think, I think there was two. It just transitioned halfway through. Yeah, I definitely felt that transition. Um, but I feel like the book overall was closer to John because Bernard is so he's he's closer to us than a lot of people in his society are, but he's still definitely of that society. So I think John is overall the person that we identify the most with. But uh, I also f found I can't. Is her name pronounced Lenina or Lenina or? Uh, in, my, in my head, it was Lenina. Yeah. Yeah, Lenina. I think. I I thought she was really interesting because she's much more an insider to the world than Bernard is, but she was very sympathetic. And when we're when we were inside her head, the world kind of makes sense, which is like kind of disturbing. But it was so interesting to see things through her eyes, like how how she she's like a woman talking about who she's going to go on dates with. And her worry about a guy isn't that he's going to cheat on her or that he's with other women. It's that he's not. That was like really a really interesting thing because it's so the opposite of real life that I found that really cool. But uh, and it was interesting how she struggled against her. She kind of had monogamous feelings toward John at the end, but her struggle was against that, which is like just so alien. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why, like I said earlier, it's, it was hard to get into, kind of get into their head. Um, yeah. As for, uh, I would say Bernard, I wouldn't really call him. I mean, you could kind of say he's the protagonist of the first half of the book, but I think he was he, him and Lenina were, were more there for the first half to help us get into that mindset of this is how these people view the world, and then right. then have John come in and uh, so it in fact you could kind of say that it's it's still you know partially setting up the the, the set of the of the you know this play that was what Ooh, happened after John. That's a pretty good argument. Him. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah, and uh, Marx is interesting because he's. That's, it's so weird to say that because my cat's name is Marx and he's like around me. <laughs> is, is the <laughs> other brother. one named Stalin? <laughs> no. <laughs> my brother named him a couple years ago when he was going through a phase. <laughs> but uh, he was interesting to me because he was part of the world, but because he was an anomaly, you know, like he, he was an alpha plus, but he has the body of a, a lower a lower um like cast that was really interesting because that's kind of one of the markers of a a traditional protagonist you know like being part of this world but being like fundamentally anomalous and alien and you don't fit in and you're kind of a rebel so it, he had the marker of kind of a hero but as it went on he ultimately kind of succumbed to the world and his conditioning and he he didn't end up being the moral hero yeah he didn't have the moral arc he didn't have the the traditional story arc of a hero where you start off struggling and then there's you know the, the conflict and then at the end you come out on top he didn't have that at all uh but then yeah. again then again neither did john no no for sure that's why i think it's ultimately a dystopia yes absolutely <laughs> And a tragedy for sure. Bad things happen to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> the end is just sad. At the end, movies get made about him and it's 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 all weird at the end. And okay, spoiler alert to anybody listening, uh, John dies at the end. <laughs> yes. Uh the, the the end, like the last quarter or so was so weird to me because I read it on a plane and then in a hotel room in Las Vegas and I was kind of out of it. Oh, perfect. 
<laughs> it was very, very weird. Take any soma? Um, <laughs> I felt like I had. Um, yeah, so my next question is, what do you think about the use of soma in the novel? Would you take soma if you had the opportunity? I would take it once to see what it's like. <laughs> yes, me too. I, 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 I would... Like I would, I the way I the way I think of it, um, I probably would just out of raw curiosity. But it it seemed like in the book that there was something about taking soma that once you had it once, it was very hard not to do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, that, and it would make sense if that was the case, you know, to, for it to be at least at least minorly addictive. Um, yeah, and they were taking more and more at a time. Like, you know, in the beginning, it was like, she took a half gram tablet of Soma. And by the end, it was like, she took six. I think, I think that more had to do with the, uh, uh, the situation she was in. But um, yeah, because I mean, if it was if it was addicted to her, like within the arc of a story, it was like 12 times as much. Then, then they yeah. wouldn't have a very stable society for very long. But um, uh, but I definitely think that there was something that uh, once you took it once, it'd be very hard not to do it again, mm -hmm. partially because... I mean, this is this is basically the super drug. It has no adverse effects, it has, and it, it, it's it's all good. Um, and anything else you do just wouldn't live up to that. Oh yeah, for and sure. So it, it it would definitely take a a, certain, a special person to, or at least it would take a fairly mer morally strong person, which these people are not, to uh, uh to uh, resist that. I guess. Yeah, for sure. So on that level, I might just I probably would just tr not do it even once and try to beat my curiosity back yeah for sure like uh i know cody do you like jordan peterson i know blake does yes yeah uh do you know akira the don who makes like the <laughs> yeah, the, J the jbp wave i just bought his album <laughs> yeah no. me too it's amazing he's this like electronic music artist and he makes songs from clips of jordan peterson speaking oh that's and cool. uh it's amazing uh, one of the songs on his new album is called the Jordan P. B. B. Peterson drinking song. Oh, and it's, great. it's so good. It's so catchy, but, uh, it's all made up of clips of him talking about alcohol and alcoholism. <laughs> and, uh, he talks about how, you know, like the mystery isn't why people drink. It's why they don't, why they ever stop drinking. And, uh, he talks about how the drinking, it, well, adventure will cure the drinking because the drinking is actually a substitute for adventure. And uh, that's totally what Soma is. Mm -hmm. It's a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. They even call it that. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah. That's crazy. I also think it's interesting that, uh, and Cody, this is something you mentioned too that's mentioned in the book, is that it's advertised as not having any negative side effects. And yet we see, and yet we see that it does, because of the, the the psychological addiction, the need for people to to do it. I guess uh, I, was, I guess I meant like uh, short term. Yes, the the short. Like in terms of biological, you know, it doesn't you know give you cancer or anything, but it does harm to your life. And as we saw with with Linda, with John's mother, uh, she just yeah. retreated, and it ended up killing her. So mm -hmm. that's. That's a negative side effect, but yeah. they didn't. They didn't seem to care. They didn't treat it as such. They 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 treated it as perfectly normal and acceptable, and uh, that I think that that's just wraps into the idea that the any one individual doesn't actually matter at all. Uh, the collectivist viewpoint. Um, I think that the the, the phrase they used was uh, there. Each person is just a cell in the body, the societal body. So right. if, if a cell gets destroyed, the, the body keeps living. That's fine. Uh, so if somebody happens to use too much soma and withdraw and get sent into the, the basically the palliative care ward, then uh, that's fine. It doesn't really matter because no individual actually matters. Um, but that actually is a pretty bad side effect of soma. Yeah, um, I would. I t uh, to that I would say that most people didn't seem to. Most people, like most older people, didn't even like. For example, the guy she had John with. I don't remember his name, but um, didn't seem to be be in that uh, situation himself. It, it seemed to be more like it was a, a product of Soma and her circumstance of not having it forever and having to deal with the 
yeah. whatever, whatever thing they had with at, on yes. the reservation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But because she had this, she could just do that completely and never have to resolve her issues. And it ended up killing right. her. No, I agree with that. I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to say that it doesn't seem like that's a normal thing that happens to the average person. Yeah, that's interesting because she ended up living most of her life on the reservation where she became an alcoholic mm -hmm. because it was the only alternative to Soma that she had. And of course, she needed something. She was used to having something. So she ended up becoming this. She's such an interesting character, how she's described, because we see her through the lens of through like Lenina finds her like horrifying and everyone finds her horrifying except for John because you know he's her son and he grew up with her and everything but through their eyes she's repulsive but her just the description of her from our perspective of being like modern humans it she sounds like a regular kind of kind of sad pathetic down and out character but she sounds like someone you'd meet on the street mm -hmm. but in the book she's so horrifying to everybody that was super interesting i actually really liked her as a character, I thought she was super interesting. Yeah, very sympathetic as well. You, you, can oh, yeah. wonder, you can understand what she's going through and has gone yep. through. And, it's, and, and it was so interesting because she was basically just Lenina, but on a different path. But she never really lost her brainwashing or anything. Like, right to the end, you know, she was so happy to come back from the reservation. And she was so happy to, you know, like, have her Soma and stuff. But she never really... She wasn't like John, where she enjoyed where she was. She was always yearning for the world state and for her old worlds, even like right up to the end. She was uh, John in reverse. Uh, yeah, she, totally. She, she grew up in the, the controlled world and went to the free wild world and barely managed to survive. And he came in the, from the wild world, the savage world, and went into civilization. And that went horribly wrong as well. And he didn't manage to survive. Yeah. Yeah, I found her a really interesting character. I think, like, a, a book about her story would be really fascinating. It would be really sad, but it would be really cool. Um, My next question is... <laughs> I, I, I looked up discussion questions for this. I just kind of Googled Brave New World discussion questions. And one made me chuckle, so I thought I would add it. And it's, do you think Brave New World is feminist by a modern standard? What about by the standards of the time? And also, is it racist? So we'll start with feminist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm glad that you. I'm glad that you picked this because it made you laugh. Because it made me laugh as well. Yeah. Yeah. Obvi ob obviously, no, no, it's not feminist <laughs> by modern standard. In fact. Uh, First off, it's written by a cis white male, so it should be banned right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, Never for mind sure. what's in the book. Uh, <laughs> it uses terrible language like savage and uh, Negro. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, so yes, no, it, right? definitely is, it definitely is racist. Let's just it's, say. Uh, it, 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 it depicts uh, a sexual assault. Um, not not, yep. not, by, not not from Lenina on John. No, 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 from John on Lenina. Um, yeah. Never, yeah. Never mind the uh, that she got naked and basically, you know, accosted him. Uh, yeah. You know, no means no. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a great scene. Yeah, it's all of the things that uh, that the modern feminist movement, uh, the the regressive left, would hate. Uh, and so, no, I'm surprised they haven't banned it already. Yeah, it's funny though because some of the revulsion for motherhood is something that they have well, so that's true so a feminist an analysis would probably be like yeah it's it's bad for women blah 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 but it did tell women that they shouldn't be mothers yeah so and, it, would, and it, makes, it would get like half a, a point it makes a scientific feature where they could kill all men and the human race true. would survive that's right yeah I I don't know if that's necessarily uh, how I would how I would characterize it. I, um, because the, the whole thing with John that, that was not supposed that's abnormal. That's not uh, that is yeah. against what the society would 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 expect. Um, but then I mean then again there weren't like legal repercussions for it. So I I, I can see the point there. Um, 
But, but Cody, you have to remember that context doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say, it, well, and this this is this is something that was, I mean, like you said, you said you found it on a on a discussion for on like you just Googled it, and so it's kind of yeah. um, uh, different from all the other questions. But uh, I would say that uh, I think the racist question is a lot easier. I would say it is it is racist. Um, not so much because of the language it uses, but uh, because of how they see the, the people who live uh, 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 it, on the reservation. And I'm just I'm talking from a uh, like right, a regressive yeah. left, like a, a a leftist perspective, I guess. Um, whereas we would call that more culturalist or something. But yeah. um, they might they might just see it. Uh, they might just see the people themselves as inferior or something. I don't know. They didn't really delve into that a ton because um, they weren't on the reservation for very long. Uh, they would. Uh, but, they'd also hate the fact that there was one part where uh, uh, he pointed out. He specifically pointed out that I think it was the epsilon minus semi morons. Right. Yeah. They, they, oh my were, God. they, they were. They uh, were. They were a bunch of twins, but they were black. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, oh, I, they're, they're going to hate that. Like... <laughs> <laughs> never. Never mind that. You know, there's white ones too, and there could be blacks anywhere. It it, it, yeah. it, it, it seemed like in this control society that they had, they didn't really care about race at all. It's just everybody True. was doing everything. Uh, yeah. But of course, the the modern left it, would just hate it, it. It was more based on the caste you were you were you were put in. Absolutely. Um, it's very socialist and communist. Um, yeah, and, well, and, and that's why that's why I'm saying like uh, this level of like even if they would t change certain things, this level of control, I think this is this this is very much what they would push towards, and they would just you know be the, being the institutionalists that they are, they would just work their way, uh, they would just put themselves at the top of the hierarchy, um, yeah. and that they would be in control. And I think, and that's why I don't think I think there are definitely things just out of as a product of the time this was written in. I think that these are definitely things that uh, you know, modern feminist, modern um, anti-racist with air quotes um, <laughs> would uh, uh, would change. But I think the overall society is one they would very much approve of. Oh and, yes, um, yeah, parts of it. Yes, the collectivist viewpoints, the trying to treat everybody the same. Uh, just kind of, just kind of the, the general framework, and it's just, it's more like individual rooms within that within that structure a whole structure is what they, is the only thing they would remodel like if you want to it's kind of physically imagine it yeah for sure so they'd hate the book but uh they'd still try and bring the society about. <laughs> yeah i think epsilon semi moron should be more of a meme that should, that should <laughs> that totally should, be, should be that should totally be I, an, I, I, an insult alpha, alpha beta epsilon semi moron yeah I'm gonna start using it in comment sections. <laughs> let's see, because there, there were five, right? There was alpha, beta, gamma. Um, what? Well, let's see. Was there yeah. epsilon? Was there, delta. Oh, delta epsilon. Delta, delta epsilon. Yeah. Right. And because they, they referred to the delta as semi moron sometimes as well, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it. it it's funny, like Mustafa Mond when he's like describing the world, and he's like, "They're happy to do those like menial jobs." It was just so like, "Oh my god, this is and, terrible!" Like, like the, the way people imagine people in higher caste, like I don't want to be, you know, like a beta. Like remember when we were seeing the beta children be uh, talked to? Like I don't want to be an alpha. They have to work so hard. But yeah. I want to be. I want to be the people below me because they're stupid. So I'm I'm smart, but don't have to work hard. So I'm in the best place. Yeah. Jeez, that's so crazy. And, and they've all, just like they're all happy doing their role because they've been conditioned to do their role. It's not right. freedom or or personal initiative. And and, and that and that's why this is so interesting because if if they are genuinely if they're I mean obviously we're saying you know state control and all that, but um uh uh if they are genuinely happy doing the role they're doing, is it wrong? Yeah, yeah that's what makes it it difficult. Cause yeah, no one's suffering, so right, exactly. <laughs> so it's fine, right? And so the only the only the only argument you could make is that they have certain rights before birth, um, and then those are being infringed on. But but if you can't make that argument, you can't. It's hard to make an argument against it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because you yeah, the, you'd uh, have to revert to making an argument for the the good of humanity as a whole or good advancement of society. You know, the the elimination of scientific progress of art. 
of uh, human interests, uh, all of those things. That's the argument you'd have to make, and that's a difficult one. Especially because it, re it, re it re requires a different moral standard, and it requires. Um, uh, I mean, they're they're just active. They're just they they're actively not pursuing that in the sake of for the sake of stability, and they and Mustafa's mom uh, talks about that. Yeah, for sure. They have they just have like a different orientation, mm -hmm. a societal orientation that we don't have. Yeah, it's super. It's super weird. But no, it's not feminist. Yes, it is racist. <laughs> it's not feminist, but it's also feminist at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Almost like they like controlling people. Uh -huh. <laughs> so my next question is, Brave New World was published in 1932, about 17 years before 1984 was published in 1949. It's a lot of numbers. <laughs> Do you think Brave New World would be different if it had been written in the post-war era? And how are the two novels similar and how are they different? Okay, this is a tough one. So uh, I think that it, it would probably be a little different, uh, but the overarching story would probably be the same. May, may, maybe he would have worked in some details that's a little more fascist uh, into the society. Yeah, but but the concept of the, the the socially engineered society would be about the same. Um, he was. Uh, I was a little disturbed to find out that Huxley was a proponent of eugenics. Um, <laughs> I'm and, not surprised. Yeah. Or well, uh, I, I'm. I, I you just have to remember that at, at that time it it wasn't exactly fringe. It wasn't right, outrageous. Yeah. There's was a lot of scientists and the intelligentsia that were looking into this and it was it was the brave new world. It was the scientific advance. Yeah. But he's eugenist and he continued to be that for quite a long time. Uh, I think it was uh, only only just after the war that he realized that maybe that wasn't such a good thing to talk about anymore. Um, but well, yeah, the, uh, the Germany kind of ruined that conversation. Good, luckily. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that it would have had some minor differences, but uh, the overall theme would have been the same. Also because um, even though Orwell, when Orwell wrote 1984, is very prophetic, and he did have some information about uh, what was going on with the communists, uh, it wasn't very well known, and it's not known if Huxley would have known that either. And that right. would, if he had known what was going on in, in, in the Soviet Union, yeah, that probably would have changed what the book was about. Yeah, as somebody who's read the Gulag Archipelago, totally, yes. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know if if you had the same experience because I, I also read the Gulag Archipelago, but after reading that, doesn't it seem like all of the fiction, the movies, the books? Uh, everything that talks about a dystopia or a totalitarian regime, doesn't it seem kind of tame? Kind of like, oh, yeah. it's like that, you know, it's good, but they didn't go far enough. They, they, it's like the writer didn't really quite understand what, how, how bad things can get. Oh yeah, for and sure. So you get that perspective. And so reading 1984 and reading Brave New World, you go, uh, yeah, that's pretty bad, but uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've read something worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. And you kind of feel like you've been, like you fell through a portal, saw this other world, and now you're back and no one believes you. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> that's what it's like. Like, it, like, you've seen some shit and no one will listen to you. That's what it feels like. Yeah, Hand 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 Handmaid's Tale, Pugh. that's paradise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I have but, not uh, actually read the Gulag Archipelago and I, I've been meaning to get it. You should. It took me like four months to read all of it, three, but there were three volumes. Yeah, yeah, three volumes. It took me about four months, and I was reading every single day. Like I read, I take the bus to and from work. I read all, all like the whole time, and it still took me that long. But it was so like beyond worth it. It's worth it. Uh, yeah. I would re I'd recommend it for a book club, but I think it's a little too much for people to take on. <laughs> yeah, in that case, I'd probably like seek out people who had read it. Yeah. Like specifically and not even open it up to the public because <laughs> it's so very few people will be able to just jump in and read it. But yeah, that, that, that's actually a good idea for a stream. But, but uh, back to the is, question. Yes. Yep. Sorry. I just wanted to say, but yeah, uh, back to, to what I was saying before, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, it does give quite a lot of perspective about how, you know, these, <clears throat> these writers were very imaginative and they were making a very strong, 
political and social point, but they still didn't quite get it. They didn't quite yeah. go far enough. And I get that because I didn't either until, uh, until I started learning about what was going on until I read the Gulag Archipelago. I had no idea. I thought yep. 1984 was the worst it could get. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and it gets so much worse, so much worse. Like to the point where there was a meme that went around the the liberalist group the other day. It's like Stalin, and there's a quote that's like, "I disagree with what you say, but I defend your right to say it in Siberia." And like <laughs> it, it, it made me chuckle. But in the back of my mind, I was like. Did yeah. he think, like, just whoever wrote this, did they think that they were allowed to speak freely in Siberia? Yeah, no, yes. no, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> that, like, even in exile after you left your gulag, it was more oppressive than ever. But, have it, like, you, <laughs> ha, have any of you, either of you uh, read Night by Eli Weisel? No, but I want to. It's, it's, it's a very good book. It's short, it's short so it's yeah. not the monster that Gulag Herpelio sounds like, but but it, it's a very similar thing. It's someone who you know lived through the Holocaust. He actually died like was it six months ago or something like that. Yeah. But it's a very good book. I read it in high school and I I bought it. I haven't re re reread it yet, but it, it, it's a, it's a good book. Maybe even one worth uh, doing a book club thing about it because it's it's not super long. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. I'll include it in the poll for the next one because I have wanted to read that one. Um. So my answer for the question is that I think if he had written Brave New World in the post-war era, the tone of the novel would be entirely different. I think it would have a much more dark, sinister tone. And it would just be a lot tenser and more full of dread the way that 1984 is. Because he was just kind of musing on what this future would be like and he hadn't seen the full scope of what could happen in a world when different powers struggle for control. So I think if it had been written later, it would be a much darker, scarier book. Oh. And I also think that 1984 had had a lot more technological kind of uh, knowledge. Like, you know, there's the screens in everybody's houses that watch everybody. So Brave New World was kind of pre any kind of technology like that so he couldn't really even imagine it but but it had flying cars it did well, something i'm still bitter that we don't have i know right ah, you'd think yeah 2015 came and went and no flying cars thank yeah. you uh, 1984 1980 or no it was back to the future sorry i got the yeah. year right but not the title <laughs> i'm suing it's not fair you have to sue a lot of people because everyone everyone thought it was going to happen. So one of the uh, the other similarities, I guess it's a similarity and then a difference that I'm going to list here. One of the similarities mm -hmm. is uh, it's th some of the main characters. I'm not using the word protagonist because you know it could yeah. be Bernard or John, but the main characters they were they were struggling to be individuals within a very restrictive society, a very restrictive situation where very, where bad things could happen if they get caught. Uh, you know, that's very obvious in 1984. It's a little more subtle in, in Brave New World. Uh, yeah. where the, the ramifications aren't, you know, torture or death. It's, yeah. you know, oh no, you get to ascend to an island. Um, but it's a similar theme where they're both trying to be themselves. They're, the, the characters are trying to be themselves within the restrictive society. Now, one of the main differences is that um, the with with John, John Savage, he came in from the outside and he it was entertained. Like he was, they entertained yeah. him. They, they, they accepted him and as an experiment to see what was going to happen. He kind of had free reign to go and do his own thing because he was unusual. Right. Uh, and in 1984, none of that happened. It was all everything, a tight grip on everyone. In 1984, yeah. they never would have allowed John Savage to live, never oh, right. come into the society. So sure, yeah. very big differences. And, and that's part of the reason why I, I think there's something, I mean, I'm sure there's, if, if, I, if I was more read in dystopian novels, I might have a better idea, but there is something of a dichotomy between the two books. And that's why if, if writing after the the World War II had would have changed the 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 uh, you know the story of Brave New World made it more like Orwell's book, 
I would that would that would be that would be a very unfortunate loss because I think this book dichotomizes that very well. Whereas, or like I said earlier, Orwell, Orwell's book 1984 is the you know the totalitarian dictatorship. They have control, and it's that it's yeah. controlled by force. Whereas the uh, Brave New World is more of a um, uh, control by satisfaction. Really, it's just a, it's a control by uh, by contentness. Right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's it's oh, it's a more benevolent benevolent society on the surface, a lot more. One of the uh, the other things is uh, something that I read in uh, the introduction in the book that I have. Uh, my copy of the book has an introduction by David Bradshaw, uh, and uh, he kind of talks about the environment that the book was written in and Orwell's beliefs and uh, Orwell's <laughs> Huxley's beliefs uh, and stuff like that. And he, uh, I don't know enough about to, to whether to judge whether this is true or not, but he brought up the point where the book seems very, it seems almost ambivalent, almost indecisive between which world is better. Uh, mm. The, you know, it, it, written as like, okay, he's playing with this idea that this socially engineered controlled society might be good. But maybe it's not, but maybe it is. And then he's yeah. con contrasting it to the, the quote unquote natural way of living. And, you know, maybe that's good, but maybe it's not. It seems very ambivalent. And uh, that's not the case for, for 1984. That's true. The, the yeah. message is very, very clear that this is horrible. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, that's true. It's written kind of as more of a, a quote unquote objective it, view very, of the very story. Ma very matter of factly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah brave, both sides gets weighed. Yeah, more like an intellectual exercise than mm -hmm. uh, moralizing. Yeah, for sure. Not that 84, 1984 is strictly moralizing, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It also moralizes in the right way. And it, it, 1984 is interesting because I really, I want that to win a poll at some point because I need to reread it. But uh, it's so interesting how every political side, like if you take right and left, both sides use it and both sides relate to it. But in it, and it somehow works perfectly for both, for either side, but their points are so different that it doesn't seem possible that the same book can be used by either side, but it can. I, th I think that might just be anti-authoritarian with a tribal overlay. Like it's just that they they don't want they don't want the wrong people the, the people who would would say that don't want the other side in control. And so maybe that's where they can point that, to yeah, that it'd together. Be, it's the attitude. It would be okay if we did it because we'd do it right. It's totally yeah. wrong if the other do it. Yeah, for or, sure. Or not not even necessarily that. I mean, there are people who say that no one should have the authority. But both sides can point to each to each other, no matter how authoritarian they are, and say we don't want the other side to have authority. Yeah, and so that's why it's so universal. Yeah. That would make sense, at least to me. Yeah, it's yeah. it's only not hypocritical for the the non authoritarian people to point out that it's bad. If mm -hmm. you're authoritarian <laughs> yeah. and you're trying to point out that it's bad, then you're a hypocrite. So yeah, for sure, totally. So the final question is. In 1958, Huxley published Brave New World Revisited. It's a short essay in which Huxley compares Brave New World's vision of the future with how things were really were 26 years later. Have you read it or would you? I have not, but I would. And I wasn't sure if we were going to mention it. Otherwise, I probably would have found a way to get it. But I didn't, uh, I, I just, I didn't know if we were going to talk about it. So I didn't put, make, it, make it a priority. Yeah, I, I actually really want to find it now because I didn't really know about it and then I found out about it later. And there's a certain paperback copy that has both in one and I kind of wish I'd gotten that now. That's my copy. Oh, uh, yeah? I have a copy from uh, Flamingo Modern Classic. Uh, it has the foreword that I mentioned as well as uh, the, the... It's basically an essay. I think it's like 15 pages, uh, which is the revisited. It's basically him writing a foreword to his book. I read it and then I did my best to forget about it because <laughs> I felt that it would it would uh, influence how I was reading the story. Um, and it there were parts of it that I found a little disappointing about his vision about how he would rewrite it. There was something about him something about him uh, uh, saying if he wanted to if he had a chance to rewrite it, 
he would add a third option for John at the end. Um, another another thing for him to do. And I'm sorry, at the moment I can't remember what it was, but I read it and went, no, that would suck. That would just not <laughs> that would not be good at all. Um, but I do remember that he specifically said that he he doesn't have any desire to rewrite it. He doesn't have any desire to edit it. So he acknowledged it's a, it was a a product of his of the time of his beliefs at the time and his attempts to edit it would most likely destroy uh, anything anything that it was anything good that it was. So there's that. He basically admitted that if he had a chance to rewrite it, he would. Well, that's good. That's a good good stance for a writer to take. I haven't read it, but I really want to now. Should be able to find it online. That's probably. It doesn't take uh, long to read, and it's probably yeah. public domain by now. Yeah. Find an EPUB. Yeah, because so I think that would be interesting. And he wrote it in '58, so that's after the war. After 1984, had made an impact by then. So, yeah, it'd be interesting. Anyway, uh, any final thoughts? Um, I think uh, one kind one kind of uh, uh, thing is it, it was really like I, I think I, I mentioned it earlier that it's really hard to determine like where is the wrong thing that's going on because obviously this is not this, this society is not one we want to live in looking from the outside mm -hmm. but where exactly do is the uh, the where exactly along the line is the moral failing where and, and it could be just because the whole thing is but it feels wrong but it's hard it's hard to uh, uh, like you know say like oh this this thing that they're doing is immoral or something because of how uh, uh, consensual it all is once at least once they're indoctrinated but that happens a lot of times before they're born so they can't really resist it well I think that's the thing I think the the genetic engineering and the conditioning is where it starts. It starts like right from the conception. Mm -hmm. How wrong it is, right? Because um, really, it's it's not really consensual when you think of it that way. Because if people were were being produced the way they're supposed to be being produced, not it it would all fall apart and it would all be non consensual. Right. So, um, it, it would have to be, it would have to be nineteen eighty four then. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I guess I guess what I mean is. Um, you definitely have to have, uh, you know, rights for people before they're born, and I, that just gets into a conversation that, um, right? Yeah, uh, people. I I don't think people want to have right now. <laughs> mm. At least some people. I don't know. There's also something else that uh, kind of bothered me about the structure of the society. Uh, yeah, it, in that it's it, it was a little unrealistic, in that um, there's. You have to follow me here for a second. Mm -hmm. So Mustafa Mond, um, during the big uh, speech that he has near the end, yeah, he pretty much reveals that you know he's he's an alpha plus, but he's he himself is a little outside the system because he's in control. He knows why society is made the way it is. He knows um, why things are banned or for, forbidden. He knows yeah. he knows why things are conditioned, and he he has a line that basically I think it says something like, uh, "I make the rules so I can also break them," uh, which means he can live with outside he he lives outside the rules that he's making for everybody else. Um, now that's very you know that's very true. You have people that are at the top they they do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So where I'm going with this is that there this the the way that the society is structured assumes that everybody is conditioned to want to live in that society and keep it going however we have people that are at the top the world controllers that are cynically manipulating people in order to keep things going forward there's no guarantee that those people would actually want to keep things going in that same way because oh, they've, yeah. they've broken that 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 conditioning yeah. They could very easily turn it into, you know, a one percent versus ninety nine percent. Just, you know, they got a, they've got, you know, four million slaves, and nobody could say or do anything about it because they have that absolute control. And that part I found a little unrealistic, knowing human nature and how the authoritarian systems work. Is that inevitably, even if it started out like what was depicted in Brave New World, it would go badly very, very quickly. Somebody at the top would corrupt it all. 
And uh, yeah, that in itself, to me, makes it an unethical system because it will inevitably end up in absolute tyranny. Yeah, for sure. And the, I, the, the, I, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. And the, I hadn't really thought about the fact that, uh, and, and I remember it now that you mentioned it, but I hadn't thought about the fact that uh, Mustafa Mond didn't have to follow the rules that he had created. And so I, I, I had, that's something that to consider as well. So good point. Yeah. I, I love that like villain speech at the end. There's so many good quotes. There's so many good quotes in this book in general. Like I want to go back and like re like underline all the parts that I liked, turn them into memes. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to bring up one final thing. Um, mm -hmm. I know we've we ended up our end of the questions. Um, it's a little it's a little thought about Bernard Marx and uh, why he didn't quite fit in. And I think it might it might have been something to do with the way that he was gestated or uh, the social <laughs> conditioning. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it also had to do with what his job was. Uh, he was intrinsically aware of the social conditioning that everybody. Went through. Right. So we saw that again and again and again when when somebody would just mindlessly repeat one of the phrases that they were indoctrinated with, he would respond with, you know, seventy-two times a week for three weeks between the ages of twelve and fourteen. Yeah, you know, so, something like that. That's how often these people were exposed to it. So he knew where all of this was coming from, and so he had this perspective about um, the conditioning and. and a bit of a cynical attitude towards it and how he, he didn't really want to go along with it because he knew what it was. Um, right. But um, that's, that seemed to be only when things were going against him. Yes. It, it, yeah. It, it, it seemed that once, once things were going his way, he was perfectly fine with, with, you know, being, being on top socially. Yes. And he was, so, he was a very prototypical weak human that was very much interested in social status. Uh, that, that exists whether with social social conditioning or not, mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so that I thought that was a very interesting point because um, I, I kind of liken the the sleep learning, the repetition of these um, banal uh, statements, these yeah. designed to elicit emotions or, or viewpoints. I liken those to what happens in, in cult like behavior or indoctrination everywhere else, whether it's religious or uh, the extreme left, you know, the, uh, the postmodernists, um, they get this lingo, these things that they just repeat over and yeah. over and over and over and over again. And Bernard knew where this came from, so he kind of rebelled against it. So I kind of hope that if there's somebody that's in one of these cults and they kind of step back and they learn where this comes from and why people are saying what they're saying, then there's a hope that they can break free of the indoctrination. Uh, it's kind of a high idea. It's kind of out there, but I, 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 I gave it a lot of thought as I was reading through the book and said, you know what? If people are repeating these things over and over again. It's it's learned behavior. It's, it's indoctrination. It's just like the real world. It's just in the book. It's given a scientific background. You don't need a scientific background because it happens for real in the real world. And uh, my hope is that if you can, if you can figure out how to get these people to understand why they're saying what they're saying, that maybe they might be able to break free of it. For sure, and you see that all the time. That's kind of like a, a trope of fiction where you know people kind of, well, like the, again with the Matrix, you know, like once you kind of see once you know that you're in the simulation, you can kind of break out of it. It's the same with like when you're dreaming. Like I always have a thing where I realize I'm dreaming and then I wake up. So maybe that's kind of naive of Huxley to think that that wouldn't eventually kick in because these people are human. Well, maybe not like the epsilon semi morons, but like the smarter ones, they are human. So I think that they would eventually get to that point where they kind of realize what's going on and snap out of it. Yeah, definitely the elf is an alpha plus. Because um, yeah. it was hinted out at the book that those people had more free reign. They had more responsibility and, and a wider yeah. range of knowledge and, and definitely higher intelligence. So you would think that there'd be more Bernard Marxes out there. And there might very well be, like because it was hinted at that there were the is these islands that they were sending these yeah. people to. We never got an idea of how many. 
Maybe it, maybe yeah. it's hundreds, maybe it's thousands, maybe there's a couple million people on islands. Yeah, for sure. So maybe the world state is actually the minority of people and maybe they're just barely clinging to their existence. They just have the technological uh, ability to enforce their society and prevent anybody else from taking over. Yeah. The, the, the gas attacks that they were talking about. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up before we finished was uh, uh, the character of uh, Helmholtz Watson. Yeah, I liked him. I, I really liked him as well. Um, just just his, it seemed like he was, uh, uh, he, whereas Bernard was, uh, you know, just below what it was expected of his cast, he was just above. Uh, to the point where he was getting those feelings of individuality and he wanted to do more. Um, yeah. And uh, and like my favorite my favorite like moment in the book was when John was calling on them to you know rebel and Helmholtz was right there with him. And yeah. throwing, throwing the soma out the window. Yeah, I really yeah. liked that too. He seemed like a man that was that was uh, operating on principle. Mm -hmm. uh, he had his beliefs, he had his desires, and he wasn't gonna give them up for something as trivial as social status, temporary social status. I really, even though I don't have much affinity for poetry itself, uh, and that was his thing, I, I really like that character quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, very like good guy. And like him and Bernard kind of had like a bit of a buddy, like good cop, bad cop kind of relationship. I really liked that. I think, I think the character of Helmholtz Watson helped to serve exactly how depraved Bernard could be. How yeah. bad, if you didn't have somebody like Helmholtz to, to compare him against, you might be a little bit more willing to forgive Bernard for his bad behavior. Yeah. Uh, but because you had that contrast, it, it, it was crystal clear that he wasn't supposed to be acting that way. Yeah, for sure. I want to know where the name Helmholtz came from. It sounds German, doesn't it, or Belgian? Yeah, it's so weird. It's it stands out among everybody else. That uh, and Pope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought the names were a little bit on the nose. It was, yeah. it was a little bit a little bit silly. What was with the Ford thing? So was oh, was like yeah. was Henry Ford yeah. literally like their <laughs> Jesus? Uh, no, that, no, that's exactly it. That it is it is Henry Ford. Um, <laughs> And that's uh, because, um, you know, again, in context, at the time it was written, Henry Ford had right. just, just, I think it was probably about 10, 15 years ago, invented the assembly line and mass production, uh, right. which was revolutionizing the world. Um, and so he was extending that and saying, okay, this guy invented this new thing that transforms the world. Let's make him the founder of this new world. And uh, right. yeah. they just he just kind of made him into the, into the semi-deity or the, you know, yeah, the big I brother. thought that was really yeah. funny. Yeah, because like it just made me think of like t like today that person will probably be like Jeff Bezos. So that's like thirty <laughs> years from now, us being yeah. like Bezos save you. Yeah, or Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Musk be with you. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of funny. You you read it as being kind of funny now. Maybe it was funny back then too. I don't know, but uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it, was it was very on the nose, a little yeah. bit like obvious and silly, but. And like Marx, Lenina, yeah, like, come on, John uh, Savage. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I think Savage was just because they considered him a savage, and so he didn't have a last name, probably. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't. Um, um, and also, you know, again, in the context, I'm pretty sure that in the 30s, I think in the 30s, Savage still meant wild. We have a different meaning of it now, you know, more like yeah. bar barbarian or maybe even native. But yeah. I, I think it was still just considered to mean wild back in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, I uh, I looked up Helmholtz, and the first one that came up was a um, a German physician and physicist who had the last name Helmholtz, who died like forty years before this came out. So maybe, um, maybe there was some connection there that he there was a reason he picked that name or something. Maybe he did something. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Much. I have to look more into like his, what he did, but um, that's the that's the only thing that seems to come up. But it seems to be German at least. Yeah, that would be interesting. I'm sure there's some kind of crazy connection there. And it could be a coincidence, um, but uh, John is a very biblical name, and his devotion to Shakespeare and the way he wanted to live was very religious. Yeah. It was very, very religious. Um, again, John's a very common name, and it could be John Doe, meaning John Everyman. But 
there's definitely that connection as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, shall we shut her down? Yeah, sure. Yeah. This was great. Sounds good. Yeah, this is awesome. So I'll be putting up the poll for the next book in the next couple of days. And um, uh, yeah. well, uh, one, one book that might be interesting. So I heard someone mention last time, uh, Sapiens. Right. Yeah, I've, I've read most of that. Um, have you heard of uh, another book you wrote, uh, Homo, Homo Deus? Yes. Yeah. It's like the sequel kind to of. Sapiens. Yeah. I, I read Sapiens and I have uh, Homo Deus on my, uh, on my kind of reading list. Um, so that might, that might be interesting looking forward. Yeah, that would be a good one. Um, yeah, I'll put that on the list. So yeah, awesome talking to you guys. Same, and, thanks uh, for setting this up. Oh yeah, no fun. worries. Yeah, okay, see you later. All right, thanks, bye.